Stevenson, as well as being a composer, is in fact one of the foremost authorities on the life and the works of Ferruccio Busoni. And in fact, um, when Ronalds first started doing research, he was probably very, one of the very, very first people to research Busoni, apart from Busoni's own students, who were still alive at the time, obviously. And uh, Ronald has been a researcher for some 50 years now, the life and works of Busoni and, and all matters to do with Busoni. And I thought perhaps the thing we should perhaps chat about first and look at is the fact that still Busoni's original music, particularly his original piano music, is still very much neglected in the concert platform. Certainly most people, or um, most pianists, will play some of the Busoni Bach transcriptions, but, and even possibly the Bizet um, fantasy, but very few are playing any of the original music. And I wonder, Ronald, do you have any thoughts about this, particularly yeah. about um, how it's changed possibly in the last 50 years? Yeah. Well, when I visited Signora Gerda Busoni, Gerda Busoni, in Stockholm, she said that she was once introduced to someone, in all seriousness, as Mrs. Bach Busoni, <laughs> in America. Where else? <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. Could we just have a duck up over your question? Yes, so I do try to answer your question. Um, how, how, why do you feel Mozoni has been neglected? Uh, and has that situation changed over the last 15 years or so? I energetically refuse, refute and refuse this suggestion that Busoni has been neglected. I think it's audiences who are neglected <laughs> in not performing, in not having his work performed a little more often. And why would you say pianists have therefore neglected to perform him? <laughs> I haven't done it. John Hopkins didn't do it. <laughs> well, perhaps a bit shy of hard work. <laughs> I also wonder if it's not to do with the fact that he's very hard to pigeonhole. Um, he is both Italianate and Teutonic. He is both pianist and composer. He is, he is both transcriber and original musician, thinker and musician. Yes, well, Stravinsky transcribed many works and uh, had many styles, didn't he? More than Busoni had, I think, and yet he's accepted because he had publicity behind him. Who's only didn't have publicity behind him at all, didn't want it. Would it perhaps also be safe to say that uh, Stravinsky was a better publicist than was it? Yes, self publicist, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but surely, when you first started researching Busoni, um, many of his students were still alive and playing. I mean, did they did they form the same kind of band that perhaps Liszt's pupils formed at the beginning of the century and promoted Liszt? No, I don't think so. No, I I, I think um, Busoni's students who performed his work were rather few. I mean, Aegon Petri, who's the most famous, mm. although I think not the most characteristic, um, didn't perform a great deal of Busoni. He recorded some later on in his life, the fantasy of Gunsmanistica. But most of them were <coughs> concerned with their own careers. I, I worked with a Busoni student. Uh, Weiss from America, who had been with Busoni, Edward Weiss, who had been with Busoni in different countries, in America, in Germany, in Switzerland, and had studied with him for very many years. And uh, he is one of the few Busoni students who was loyal to Busoni's work and played it very often. Edward Weiss, who have recordings available still, I think, on the International Piano Library um, <coughs> series. Does that answer your question? Tell me when I'm not answering your question. Paul, you were making an interesting point that perhaps, sorry, this is a conversation we had earlier, that perhaps <laughs> it was the darkness of some of the music that uh, perhaps led to that. I wonder if you could do it. Well, that. I think that may have something to do with it. If you think of the, um, the really crucial works for piano, um, I suppose, in a sense, begin with the elegies. Yes. They are yes. um, extraordinary. Uh, leaps in towards a new language, but they are really very dark 
coloured, with a few exceptions, of course, the um, uh, Duke Meadsley's uh, fantasy um, certainly doesn't fall into that category, but uh, many of those works do. And then the series of sonatinas, the first two, which are uh, incredibly important works, as we're going to hear this afternoon, I think, in the case of number two. Not only are they dark, but I think that um, Carl is right to say that they don't fit into new categories. And I think this is, uh, for me, something rather fundamental about Buzoni as a composer, that uh, he was one of those figures who, while not obsessed with the notion of originality, was certainly um, uh, always eager to explore new stylistic avenues. But for him, I don't know whether Ronald will agree, but it seems to me that for him, um, uh, writing the second sonatina did not mean that he disowned all his earlier music necessarily, that he could still go back, and indeed, as we're going to hear, he went back to his Chopin variations right at the end of his life, and actually, although rewriting them, uh, also retained a lot of music, which yes, he's written right. in the 1880s. Uh, and uh, at the end of his life, you can see a work like the Toccata that we're going to hear, um, actually uh, post-dating um, a much clearer and more um, italian even Mozartian work like the Divertimento for mm -hmm. Flute and Orchestra. Uh, in other words, um, I think Buzoni accumulated a repertoire of styles and idioms across his career, uh, and that can make him perplexing. If you're looking for a composer who fits into a nice, neat, nice, neat pattern of early, middle, and late, you're not going to find it with Buzoni. And in fact, uh, we've produced a rather nice segue for me. Um, for the Chopin variations, which are basically his last important piano piece, or of medium importance, I might say, from, in effect, in this version, 1924. And yet, in fact, in many ways, this turns against the idea of the darkness of the reason. I mean, for instance, the Bizet fantasy the, on, on themes from Carmen ends very, very darkly. And yet, we have a series of Chopin variations, variations on the C minor prelude of Chopin, which is, to all intents and purposes, a funeral march. And yet, he ends this piece with a scherzo tarantella fugue, which is, is obviously very light-hearted, and in fact, almost throws off the Teutonic aspects of Busoni. And, and you were saying earlier that actually Busoni hadn't meant to finish with Dr. Faust, though we often no, see that. No, his widow told my wife and myself when we visited her in Stockholm that the romantic idea that Busoni's last intended final statement was his Dr. Faust is incorrect, that he had actually envisioned the idea of writing an, a comic Italian opera in Italian, and then the picture might have been very different. It's sad that he never achieved that. He didn't live long enough to achieve that. No, I, I mean, I do wonder if perhaps these short variations have half an eye towards yes. the lighter side. Yes, oh, I think so. I think he was already there, even though he hadn't achieved that work, mm. as I mentioned, he had achieved the aesthetic. Of course. And it, <coughs> the aesthetic is, is embodied in the work that we play for us. Um, just to introduce the piece, for any of you who perhaps don't know it, it's the nine variations on Chopin Prelude from 1924. Um, it starts with a, a little prelude in canonic inversion, uh, a technique that Bernhard Zien had first invented, and of course Ronald wrote the preface for his canonic studies. Um, uh, sorry, in a reprint of Canonic Studies, I should say. And as I say, it's a series of nine variations ending with a very light-hearted scherzo tarantella fugue, or fugetta rather, and also incorporating a par uh, well, not a parody, perhaps a homage to Chopin, and particularly the waltz. And in many ways, it's strange that right at the end of his life, um, was only was looking to Chopin because, of course, at this time he was playing Chopin very little. But uh, in fact, as, as Paul mentioned, this is an earlier work from um, the 1880s, and Busoni actually wrote a very Teutonic, very large half an hour scale work with a huge fugue on the end, in very much the Brahmsy tradition. And it seems almost that he's negating that aspect of his work with this set of variations. I'll make two Please. points before you. Well, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. One is that you're playing the last version today. That's right. And I wonder whether this actually is another reason why perhaps pianists are slightly concerned about Buzoni, because so many of the works exist in multiple versions. Uh, in fact, this is, as you say, nine variations. The slightly, the 1922 version is ten. Versions. 
And of course, the other thing is, just to mention, I hope more won't mind this, but one of the many reasons for sort of envying him is that you happen to be the owner of the autograph of this well, version. This work we went here. Yes. Well, I, I did, it was presented to me, um, and I did have it in my library for many years. I have now put it in the collection, in my collection, in the uh, Scottish National Library in Edinburgh. So it may be consulted by anybody. It's a very beautiful manuscript. And, and again, I'm right in thinking there's a completely different ending to that as well, isn't there? Yes. If, rather than what I'm about to play one day. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes, another, you know, yes he thought he could finish with, with the little waltz. Mm. Very light, very light. Right. I think it's rather near to Court Bio, oh. who was a student of his. I think his aesthetic at that time perhaps, was only being one of those very few great teachers who could learn from his students. And I, I think that's an indication of it, that uh, there is some influence of Court Bio. Right. With that, I shall uh, take care.
next we move on to 1912, which in fact was really Busoni's most experimental period. Um, it followed the uh, production of printing in 1907 of his pamphlet for, well, I suppose the future of his music, and it influenced many others later on, a sketch or an outline of a new aesthetic of music. Um, and of course, this period between 1907 to 1912 is a period when Busoni was in very close contact with Schoenberg, with the futurists. Um, in fact, Busoni was fascinated, I believe, by Opus 11 of Schoenberg, the, the three pieces. Um, yes, he, he made a, a constant version of it, yes. That, that everybody knows Bach Busoni, but very few people know Schoenberg Busoni. <laughs> <laughs> Schoenberg made that version of number two, yes. And, and in many letters to Schoenberg, he does oh, say yes. how fascinated he is by the pieces. Yes. Most, in fact, in many cases, opposite level number three, with the kind of new piano sounds, I seem to recall him quoting that he found opposite level number three with its new pianistic yes. idiom. Very, very strong, very important. Um, now, the Sonatina Seconda, which, which dates from 1912, has basically, by most commentators on the work, been considered firstly as an expressionistic outpouring in that it seems to um, juxtapose varying psychological states rather than having particularly thematic ongoing influence. And also it's often cited as a very early use of particularly advanced use of cell structure in the terms of a tone row. That is to say the, the piece actually opens with something akin to a tone row, though it's not actually a Schoenbergian tone row. And various cells of that tone row are used to basically to build up the harmony and the melody throughout this piece. And this has been suggested by many com uh, commentators to, um, to show that the piece is in fact very much after the Schoenberg idiom, if in fact rather progressive for its time. Now, I, I know you don't actually believe that it's an expressionistic work. I wonder if you could no, I don't, tell us about that. Because only uh, is on record as having described expressionism as, as poison. <laughs> uh, uh, there are uh, publications in Italy, particularly, is the, the uh, Rassegna Musicale Busoni edition mm -hmm. of 1940, I believe it is, um, January 1940, contains a letter that Busoni wrote to an Italian friend of his, in which he says that he is with Pizzetti against expressionism. Right. But you see, this this has been the, the Schoenberg business has been uh, so so effective since Hans Keller, I think, really. Uh, when Hans Keller was mentioning Schoenberg every day on Radio Three, giving everybody cold feet, all the composers who didn't like Schoenberg cold feet, you see. But, um, I, I think it's been very very effective, and I think it's quite wrong. Mm. I copied out the manuscript in the um, Staatsbibliothek in Berlin, which used to be in East Berlin as it was, uh, of Busoni's completion to the second sonatina. If he had published that, long Tarantella, uh, it might have been a different story. I think he took a wrong turning. I think Busoni took a wrong turning. I, th I think he and was. At this point, on the yes. Sonata. Yes. Uh, but he, he, he is on record as saying that he was no expressionist and was not a friend of expressionism. When, when you speak of the wrong turning, you mean that um, the, the original uh, Sonatina Seconda has an al -sal saltarello ending, isn't it? It's basically yes. a Tarantella on, Long stuck on the end. ending. Many, many pages. And was only expurgated this version yes. and put a quite simple ending to it. Um, now well, I mean, something that is much nearer to the, to the aesthetic of Schoenberg, I would say. Sure. Um, you were suggesting on the conversation we had earlier that perhaps um, this was the beginning of the Germ Germanic or Teutonic Busoni uh, as against the Italian Busoni, as if he threw out the Italian scale. Yes, I've come, uh, of course, Busoni thought it was bad enough to have one nationality. He never intended to change it, he never did change it. Uh, but he, he, I've come more and more to think that Busoni's aesthetic. And this I'm expressing for the first time now, I think, mm -hmm. was much nearer to Mozart as time went on. That is to say that it was a coalescence of the Austrian 
and the Italian. Think of Mozart's Italian operas. And, and where do you feel he, he went from that? I mean, you, you in the later works, he is right. late interest in his later interest in Mozart, particularly. And of course, this to some extent ties in with the fact that he, in 1911, it was I think he gave uh, six recitals of Liszt, which up until yes. that time, of course, he did right. particularly close to. And yes. later on in his life, he does talk about um, considering Liszt now as admiring him from afar, yes. whereas for a great deal of time he was very He was studying Mozart very much, mm. editing Mozart and so on. Yeah. Um, of course, this, this work, as listeners you won't particularly notice, there are two very, very um, unusual things, particularly for the time in it. Firstly, it is basically without bar lines. Uh, there are some bar lines, but there aren't many. And also, accidentals in the music only refer to the note in front of which they're placed. Now this is this at first sight is very confusing because you want to keep extending flats and sharps through the rest of the rest of the line or whatever. But um, I mean I sense that Busoni wanted this work to be as experimental as possible because a lot of the work could actually be barred in six four, could it not? Yes. Um, so I wonder if possibly you think that it was well aimed to be as experimental as possible. I think you know, I aim. mentioned to help my memory, I think I mentioned an unlikely source. You did, yes. Which um, rather surprised you. Really. It, it would it surprise did, everybody. Did. Yes, quite. Would you like to go ahead? Remind me. It was Palmgren. Yes. Zelim Palmgren, who was a Busoni student. Now, Palmgren wrote short piano pieces. One wouldn't particularly think of Busoni in relation to Palmgren, but uh, Palmgren did write a set of preludes, 24 preludes, and one of them, the F sharp major one, has no bar lines. And that predated Busoni's use of it. Now, Busoni kept in touch with his students. There is no doubt that he would see those values of Palmer. Right. Anyway, historically predated that. Yeah, certainly. And, and in fact, I think some of the canzones of Monpu also yes. predate that. With yes, but, but, but he wasn't a Bologna student. Well, firstly, I don't think was only was particularly aware of that. I'm not aware that he was, that was aware of that. <coughs> um, Paul, sorry, if I'm... Did you yes. know Well, I don't know. I'm letting the experts talk about this. But, um, uh, but you're I, an expert. Well, um, I, I understand exactly what Ron was saying about um, uh, about this piece, and I can understand that it do that you might feel that in a sense it's a wrong turning. It's certainly very idiosyncratic, not just in its notation, but in its musical language as well. I mean, it's striking that so much of it is non-triadic in its heart. Yes. And yes. even where there are triads, they don't behave in ways that you expect them to. So there's no sense of functional tonality operating here at all. Um, and yet the counterpoint also, it seems to me, um, doesn't function in a Schoenbergian way, um, in that it doesn't tend to drive the music forward. And it creates an extraordinary and typically Buzonian sense of sort of suspense, it seems yeah, to me. Stasis. Stasis. Yeah, stasis and and so Serenity, yes. Yeah. Um, despite the fact that on the surface the music can be quite troubled in some ways. Uh, but underlying it all, I think, um, and, and looking at it again as I have been, one is struck by the very subtle ways in which there are still tonal references. Oh, in yes. fact, one still finds tonic dominant relationships. Yes, on and, and one finds pentatonic as well. No, one doesn't do. In the second part of the work, and in fact, I think it's the second part of the work is very near to the Indian diary. Are there, are there any questions from the audience? Sorry, I Even, yes. Why do you think you did chop off the Italian ending of the 17th? I don't know, to be honest. To give you an honest reply, I don't know. I can only venture the possibility that uh, mm. he was intimidated by Schoenberg, as many people were. Busoni could be, I mean, one has the impression of Busoni being der Meister, but as a matter of fact, he could be intimidated fairly easily by certain people. He was very sensitive, and uh, he was prepared to listen to people and to learn, especially from young people, which is very unusual at that time. At that time, a professor held more authority than professors do later. 
think Jones might. <laughs> 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 I think we should probably just say that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
anybody doesn't have a program, I think there are some more on the stands there. Um, is there anybody in that position? Can I? That work is dedicated to a very great pianist, Mark Hamburg. And I heard Mark Hamburg a number of times when I was a student, because I'm a lifelong student. So uh, in the early days, uh, Mark Hamburg was playing regularly, lived in London. He was playing before the Second World War, during the Second World War, and just after the Second World War. And he was the only pianist, to my knowledge, who revived the great Anton Rubinstein. I speak of Anton, <coughs> not Arthur. Uh, Anton Rubinstein's idea of giving historical recitals. That is to say, I heard Hamburg begin with the Elizabethan virginal book and go on to the Moonlight Sonata, uh, Schumann's Carnival, some Chopin, a big Polonaise, and a Nocturne, I think. And uh, later 19th century music, um, the five, and then they cease. So that was a program, an amazing program. <laughs> Hamburg played them. He is the dedicatee of the second Sonatina Busoni. And what is significant about that work, I think one should make a study of it. I don't think a study has been made of Busoni's use of Italian directions, mm. which are phenomenal. They're, they're unique. He, he begins it, Il tutto vivace, fantastico, con energia, capriccio, e sentimento. Now, I've never seen any music that gives so many indications of interpretation. I don't think he felt that Hamburg needed it. <laughs> Not at all. Do they perhaps sum up Hamburg's style at all? I think there are elements in the piece that do. Um, well, that was a young Hamburg. I heard the old Hamburg, but he preserved his phenomenal piano playing very well, peppered with wrong notes, I may say, by the time I heard him. Um, he played the famous uh, Harmonious Blacksmith, which became the disharmonious blacksmith with wrong notes. And he, uh, but in those days, pianists were very natural, you see. And even Busoni played wrong notes. Somebody said he never played wrong notes, but he did. I have the evidence that he played the emperor when he was ill. He, he played the emperor in London. And uh, there's a passage that comes down in single notes to a chord, you remember the famous passage. And Busoni landed on a second, a major second, looked at the audience and grimaced in a friendly way and played the whole damn scale in seconds until he reached the chord. So this silly idea that Busoni was such it's almost like a god that he couldn't play a wrong note. It's nonsense. <laughs> and Hamburg was a master of wrong notes. I heard him play the harmonious blacksmith. And he played a howling wrong note in the very famous theme. The audience were actually wincing at it, you see. And he played, that was fortissimo, he played the pianissimo, the most beautiful pianissimo. And when he came to that moment, where he played the wrong note before, he looked at the audience, smiled, and arpeggiated the six three four C sharp minor up to the correct note at the top, the C sharp, and smiled at the audience. <laughs> uh, nobody dared do that. And it's, it's the three M's of music who have destroyed all this naturalness. They are the microphone, now first of all, the metronome, the microphone, and the musicologist. <laughs> have destroyed, effectively destroyed, the, the naturalness of performance. Of course it was only to play wrong note. And, and uh, we, 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 there are no wrong notes if they play from the heart. Very romantic statement, with which I expect most students of today to disagree heartily. Ronald, do we know whether Mark Hamburg liked Mark Hamburg liked the piece and did I don't, play it? I, I should think that Mark Humber was considerably in awe 
and uh, questions, questioning about the piece. I, I, there's no evidence that Hamburg ever played it publicly, to my knowledge. Later on, he, I don't think he would have done this. Perhaps it was a kind of, um, what should I say, kind of gentle teaching aspect of Busoni, that he thought that Hamburg could apply himself to something like this instead of his usual <laughs> repertoire. I don't know. <laughs> but I have no evidence that he ever played it. Um, should we move on now um, to, to folk music, really? Um, and, and here we have a tie with Busoni, or a tie between Busoni, and firstly, of course, Grieg, who was probably the first person to turn folk music into art music at the piano with his Opus 72 slot on it. Oh, wonderful um, works, yes, yeah. that he wrote at the beginning of the 20th that's, century. That's right, yes. his very last piano pieces, which are transcriptions of, folk, of Norwegian folk music for Hardanger Fiddle. And then, of course, at a, at a not, not too dissimilar time, we have Bartok, who was, in fact, who was obviously doing research into Hungarian folk music. And, of course, Bartok was actually a friend of Buzoni, yes. um, so much so that he gave the premiere, I think, of the well, Buzoni's transcription of the Liszt Spanish Rhapsody for piano and orchestra. Bartok actually gave the, the piano premiere of that. I think in Manchester. I think, right. With the Halle. And, um, and Bartok actually had Buzoni's portrait in his rooms in New York. Yes, at right. the end of Bartok's life, that's right, mm. yes. And of course, um, so, I mean, Bartok was obviously a friend. And of course, there's also a tie-in with Percy Granger, who was, for a while, Buzoni's pupil, who was also doing um, in work on folk music and trying to create it into art music. Um, now, can you tell us, I mean, you, you corresponded with Granger for quite a while. Yes. Can you tell us about the differing views or perhaps um, approaches towards folk music and its use in, um, in art music? Well, well, Percy Granger was his own worst enemy. Uh, his uh, statements were such that he would not be taken seriously academically. He deserves to be, and perhaps is becoming mm. the figure he really was uh, in, in academic appreciation. Uh, he was far more of a scholar than Busoni. I mean, one has this idea of Busoni being der Meister and a very, very serious, a great scholar and philosopher and so forth, philosopher of music, but Granger knew far more music than Busoni knew. Busoni's understanding of music began until his very last years, when he became interested in early Italian music. His music really began with Bach, essentially with Bach, and went on. Now, Granger began centuries before that. Granger edited with Dom Anselm Hughes an edition of very early Gothic music, English Gothic music, some of which dates back to the 1200s. So we shouldn't just think of Granger as a funny man of music. Uh, he was that, but he was far more than that. And uh, could you just repeat the question? Um, his use of folk music and compared to Busoni. Yes. Well, Busoni was not so informed, so well informed as Granger was. He was not the professional folklorist that Granger was. H.G. Uh, Wells, rather unexpectedly, accompanied. Percy Granger on a, uh, what should we say, a folk collecting tour, folk song collecting tours in Lincolnshire. And Wells said, and this is well documented to Percy Granger, Percy, you are not simply collecting folk music. You are documenting life. Because Granger would get all the background behind that folk song. He would ask a person's, uh, he had a way with him, he, was, he had a natural charm which disarmed people. And they would tell Granger things that they would tell nobody else. Uh, he, 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 could, he could get, for instance, the basic thing of how much money they are, or what the pension was. He would, he would, he would get, he thought that was fundamental. The, 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 perhaps a slightly Marxist in that. <laughs> um, and uh, he wanted to know all the influences behind that folk. He was very scholarly. In fact, he was uh, the father figure of what American universities are attempting to do now. What they're attempting to do, Granger did much better. And uh, Busoni wasn't that kind of figure. In, in, in fact, he didn't really 
know that much about the, sorry, we're talking about the Red Indian music that he yes. transcribed the piano. Yes, it's very unusual that he chose, that uh, was only chose the Red Indian music because he had a, a student, Natalie Curtis, a student of harmony mm -hmm. in New York, who was only taught harmony to have a little money <coughs> privately, you know, in a difficult time. And Natalie Curtis was one of his students, and she went to live with the American Indians and wrote a marvelous book called The Indian's Book with many photographs and documentation and all the melodies that was only used. It was only took them from the book, but he did meet American Indians with, through Natalie Curtis, mm -hmm. and he identified with them in a, a kind of anti-materialistic attitude to life. The, the, uh, the American Indians gave beautiful words to things that, that, that uh, white Americans uh, spoke of in, in a very uh, matter-of-fact mm. way and without any poetry at all. I, I have a quotation yes, here, in fact, from, yes. from a letter to, um, from Buzoni to his wife. And it said, um, the Indians are the only culture of people who will have nothing to do with money and who dress the most everyday things in beautiful words. How different is a businessman from Chicago by comparison? He knows Roosevelt as Teddy. The Indians know him as our great white father. Yes, thank you. That's a very good illustration. Makes the point that I was trying and to make. I think possibly it was only was as drawn to the music as he was to the otherworldliness of the kind of um, to their life, wasn't it? Well, it, yes, yes. The quick answer is yes. But it came at that time in Buzoni's career when when he was seeking. I won't say a new simplicity, mm -hmm. because the majority of listeners don't hear it as that. But I will say, and this is perhaps the problem of listening to it, a new essentiality, the yes. essence of music. He, in the Indian music, he found something essential. And, and in many ways, his ideas of absolute music, the idea of an absolute melody, that is to say, a melody from which both the harmony and the melody are derived and, and work with polyphonically, Yes, that's the Yes, that's true, but it's perhaps best illustrated in these very, very yes. busy comics, where yes. the harmony and the melody are all derived from very, very simple statements. Yes, that's right. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, I think possibly at this point we should, we should go to Paul, yes. who um, will talk about um, the, the new piece we're premiering today. Um, yes. Well, uh, yes, and this is new for me as well. Um, to answer that, I, I'm sure somebody's going to ask me, well, how did you happen to discover this? And the first thing to say is that musicologists, that benighted race to which I belong, <laughs> um, but musicologists on the whole don't discover anything, but they do occasionally diminish their own ignorance. And they do that um, by um, simply <coughs> material that librarians have known about for a very long time. And this is absolutely the case with, with this uh, particular uh, adaptation of a tune which it appears, as you'll hear, in the uh, Indianish's target book. But the story of this piece is that, uh, as Ronald was saying, um, Buzoni was given a copy of the Indian's book, a book which, by the way, I think played an important role in actually um, ameliorating the conditions, the living conditions of uh, American Indians um, in the early years of the 20th century. But he was given a copy of this book by Natalie Curtis um, in March 1910 at a concert where, interestingly enough for me anyway, Mahler was conducting uh, Buzoni's Turandot music. And uh, Buzoni evidently was intrigued by these melodies, as we know. But until uh, relatively recently, I think we all thought that Buzoni's first real creative response to these tunes um, had to wait until 1914. However, uh, in the British Library, there is uh, uh, an autograph manuscript of um, uh, another unknown uh, adaptation of, a, uh, of an Indian melody. In fact, it's headed by Buzoni and a, t uh, a first attempt at a utilization for piano. Um, and it's dated the 12th of April, 1911, so three years before the earliest of the other adaptations. And rather touchingly, uh, it has a dedication to the owner, the, the person in whose collection this is now found, 
and it says that this sketch was um, uh, copied out for Herr Stefan Zweig in memory of America and of Ferruccio Busoni. And in fact, Zweig and uh, Busoni had met in America um, on this trip in 1911. They became close friends, and indeed Zweig, I think, became an enormous admirer of yeah. Busoni's Beautiful passage. Well, one of the most beautiful passages about Busoni is in, uh, in uh, Stefan Zweig's Ausbauten for the World of Yesterday. Yes. Towards the end of the book, he writes beautifully about Busoni. And uh, this was evidently given to uh, Zweig, who took it back with him to Europe, traveling back to Europe on the same liner that carried the dying Marla, in fact, who was returning home to Vienna. Um, and it's now at the British Library because, as you may know, Stefan Zweig was a, an, in, uh, a, a, an enormously um, gifted collector of autographs. He had a very good sense of autographs and treasured them particularly documents like this, which in some sense of it, I think this is a fairly fair copy, um, show work in progress. And he assembled an enormous collection over the years, uh, much of which was sold and a great deal of which is now in the Bordner collection in Switzerland. But um, uh, a lot of it, some of it uh, remained together and ended up in London uh, and was given to the British Library a few years ago. And so this autograph is in the Zwei collection before we play, because I presume you're going to play this after. I'm the going to play straight after the okay. first time. In that case, perhaps I'll just read, because this I only discovered relatively recently, I think may um, give some clues as to how Buzoni approached this particular um, um, tune. I'll just read you the translation of the Indian text, because this is labelled a corn grinding song. It was a song sung by Indians as they ground corn. Uh, but the subject matter is, yes, it, particularly in the light of the first word of this text, which is butterflies, I think that's <laughs> not <laughs> quite the instrument one would have associated. But uh, here is the text of, of this corn grinding song. Butterflies, butterflies, now fly away to the blossoms. Fly blue wing, fly yellow wing. Now fly away to the blossoms. Fly red wing, fly white wing. Now fly away to the blossoms. Butterflies away. Butterflies fly away to the blossoms. So um, it's, uh, it may well be that the only has more in mind uh, the images of butterflies uh, rather than the act of writing corn. But we'll tell that when Carl returns and plays uh, this uh, for us. Can I just add a footnote to it? Uh, I was interviewing John Taverner from Fanfare a few weeks ago, and he was inveighing, calmly, but he was inveighing against the materialism and, and um, intellectualism of, of Western musical life. And I mentioned there's only his Indian diary to him as an antidote. He hated music, but he was fascinated by the idea.
the last great piece that was only worth the last major work, the Toccata of 1921. Um, and it was not long before he wrote the Toccata that he started talking about the young classicism, the young classicality. And um, there are various things he said about the idea of young classicality. Um, the idea was, well, I include the definite departure from what is thematic and the return to melody again as the ruler of all voices and all emotions, not in the sense of a pleasing motive, and as the bearer of the idea and the begetter of harmony, in short, the most highly developed, though not the most complicated, polyphony. And he also goes on to say, by young classicism, I mean the mastery, the sifting, and the turning of account of all the gains of previous experiments and their inclusion in strong and beautiful forms. So this is, this is a long way away from neoclassicism, which is really looking backwards. The idea was that one, one has experimented, one tried to get together all the experimental ideas and produce them in new and young forms. And in fact, one last thing that uh, was only said about it was, my idea is that young classicism signifies completion in a double sense. Completion as perfection and completion as a close, the conclusion of previous experiments. And of course, one might say, going on to other experiments in later generations, well, he hoped to do that. Now, the Toccata coming hot on the trail of that, as it were, some, some year and a half later, it would seem as if this were a, a, young, a work of young classicism. Um, and yet... May, may I just add to just a very short footnote? I, I think that the, the usual translation is wrong, and if I may hmm? make a slight decision, I think the translation you are using is incorrect, because younger classicitate doesn't mean any ism. Uzoni was enough of a Latinist to know that isimus is an exaggeration of a truth, an ism is an exaggeration of a truth. He didn't want any exaggerations. He, his concept was of a, a young classicality. There's all the difference in the world. He didn't want any isms. Uh, we, we have, you, you have been led by the translation, of course. You've been naturally reading the translation. I disagree with that. I disagree with the translation. Not with you, but the translation. <laughs> <coughs> um, now, I, I know Paul believes that this isn't necessarily a young Classicism, uh, a piece of young classicism, or young classicality, sorry. And, and I, I mean, how do you feel about the Zaccato itself and its um, approach to young classicality? It's an approach, I think, yes. Right. I don't think it was only had reached it. He had not lived long enough to reach it. Right. But it is an approach. It is. There are indications, surely. Mm. Um, but, I mean, presumably it's fairly true to say that some of the earlier works, before he'd actually talked about young classicality, for instance... Contained germs of it. Well, yes. yeah, the sonnet yes. and I mean, fantasies, etc. I seem very much more archetypically of the idea, even though previously stated. The strange thing about the Toccata is that it is so very harsh, it's so very unyielding in many ways. Um, and it has been it has been mooted that this, in fact, was the tendency of Buzoni's pianism in the latter years. Not harsh sounds, but the idea of staccato, unyielding, aloof pianism, which I suppose this is a... Is this a... Um, is this a um, I had a long, late night conversation at a, a well-known uh, festival in Britain. Long conversation with uh, the Venus pianist, Alfred Brendel. And uh, he, he told me that, I think he was telling me more about himself than about his own, that Brendel believes, he still believes, that this is the most difficult work, what you're going to play is the most difficult work in his repertoire. And uh, I identified with it very much from a kind of expressionist point of view, and I, I've already said I disagree with that. And I'm sure that uh, Fuzoni disagreed with it. It tells us more about Brendel than about the work itself, I think, that he found it the most difficult thing in his repertoire. I, I don't think it is all that difficult, isn't it? It's not that. It's Brendel has never, to my knowledge, played the Fuzoni piano concerto. He might think again. He might think again if he did. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to criticize Alfred Brendel. I, I respect him. But uh, no one is beyond criticism, even if I have criticized him. 
<laughs> and, and certainly, the, I mean, the very title of Toccata seems to look backwards to some extent, I mean, to look to previous experiments to some extent, and indeed, the division of it into Fantasia, a uh, prelude Fantasia on Chacon, again. You haven't quoted the reference at the beginning. Oh, well, I, I, will, I will, at the beginning of this piece, there is a quote from Fresco Baldi, and the, basically the translation of which is, there is nothing quite so difficult as to get to the finish, or to get to the end, which of course one might prove but, um, Alfred Brennan will write about. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, it's a quote that was only found in Fresco Baldi's yes. The Cartos and Concerners yes. of that's right. Yes. Yes. But, um, I mean, what are your views on the work? You haven't said much before. But... Well, um, <clears throat> I think it is an approach to um, this notion of Classicality, and we've got to, I think, beware of falling into the trap of thinking that the works that are most typical of young classicality are the ones that are closest to Stravinsky and neoclassicism, actually, which the Solitini you mentioned uh, is to some extent. Um, I, uh, just, I thought I'd make two observations, really. Um, uh, one is that Buzzoni himself said of a piece that it arose out of anguish and of unstable emotion. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and I think it's worth bearing in mind, I, I certainly feel that in, in the piece. Yes. Uh, I think it, uh, it is an important component. The other thing to point out, we haven't really touched on this, Charles is probably rather grateful because he's going to be talking about it, <laughs> but both this piece and uh, the Sonatina Secunda and their references contain references to two of Who's own his operas. In the case of the Sonatina, it was Dr. Faust. Here, the prelude is based on material from uh, Ibrahim Faust. Of course, the fantasy also in this pertains yes. to Dr. Faust. Exactly. So, in fact, we have references to two of Who's uh, own major operatic works here. Um, and as I say, maybe we need to uh, hear that a little more. Yes. And I mean, possibly one might consider this as a fork piece between these two completely, well, rather different uh, operas. Um, one finds some point of stasis almost in the, in the middle of two quite alternate ends of what was in his life. Um, are, are, are there any questions? Because I think we're, we're running slightly over. Um, so I shall let to cut. <laughs>
surely have the right to speak about this because I knew the man whose name I'm going to invoke very well from his childhood. And I would say that I have not been, I'm not making ridiculous comparisons, I'm just saying that I personally have not been moved by performance of who's only so much since the playing of my dear John Ogden. I've had nobody else play Puzzoni, such a generous selection of Puzzoni's work, and played with such conviction. Thank you very much. Yes, the, um, please.